What is up, guys? Welcome back. This is Hayden Shap. Um, forgive my hair is getting long, too long. But welcome to my uh, my channel where I discuss all things uh, the pursuit of truth. And for me, this is uh, the things that I really am most passionate about, at least right now in my life, and the things that I think are kind of my unique purpose or the endeavors that I'm trying to master and learn more about are truth-centered persuasion. So being persuasive and influential to individuals and to groups, but in a truth-centered way. Um, personal development that is truth-based and truth-centered, and then truth-centered leadership and organizational leadership based off of true principles, um, not off of just fads and the thing that, things that get quick, short-term results. So that's kind of what we talk about. In this uh, episode, I'm going to be continuing my study of the seven habits of highly effective people. We're on habit two, the first creation or begin with the end in mind. Habit one is I am the creator. So when I recognize that I have the power to be the creator, that I'm not just an animal that's not responsible for my own life and outcomes, that I don't have to be a product or a creature of my circumstances. Once I realize and take full responsibility for that, then I can say, okay, now that I'm the creator, what am I going to create? And that's habit two is the first creation. And then habit three is Ma the principles of management, personal management, and bringing that first creation, what you want, what you've decided, what you've created in your mind in the first version, the first creation, bring that into its second creation form into the physical reality. Okay, so in this one, we're going to talk about rescripting yourself, becoming your own first creator. Um, something that's kind of cool that I, I just read in Think and Grow Rich, I just finished Think and Grow Rich for probably like the 50th time. Literally, actually, uh, Thinking Grow Rich and Seven Habits, as well as the Book of Mormon, are three books that I try to read at least once every year, and I end up reading the Book of Mormon not enough times, and I end up reading Thinking Grow Rich and Seven Habits also not enough times, but um, several times a year, which is just, it's the way that I feel if I can govern my life by those things, everything else I can learn that are skill sets, but it's most important for me to make sure that I'm honing in on the things that matter most to me and not being limited um, in my abilities in the things that I want in my life by who I was in the past. So here we go, rescripting, becoming your own first creator. Okay, as we previous, previously observed, proactivity is based on the unique human endowment of self-awareness. So in order to be a proactive person, it's actually based on this fundamental idea that you, you have to be a self-aware being. Um, you have to actually, in, a, in, a, in an honest way, evaluate and become aware of who you are and where you're at. The two additional unique human endowments that enable us to expand our proactivity and to exercise personal leadership or to fulfill this, this role as like the creator of your life and the first creation, the other two additional human endowments in addition to self-awareness are one, imagination, and two, conscience. So these, I mean, you could get super deep in going into these three things. So self-awareness, imagination, and conscience. Um, there's a lot of arguments I feel like in the philosophy realm, like Sam Harris and many others on this idea of independent or free will. But I, I, I kind of, I, I love Stephen Covey's view on it. It seems to fall more in line with how I view and feel about things currently. Although I'm fully aware, recognize that my thoughts and feelings on things should and probably, and could and should change to be more in line with true principles ever increasingly, you know, all the time. Through imagination, and he's, so now he's going to talk about these two things we haven't quite discussed fully yet, which is an imagination and conscience. Because self-awareness is this basis of proactivity, of being a proactive person, be, of, of actually becoming or more fully like revealing who you are as an individual, as a proactive being. The self-awareness is key to that. But the key to to actually creating the life that you want as the creator of that life, the key, uh, there's two things that are the key there, and that's imagination and conscience. So now he's going to talk about these two. Through imagination, we can visualize the uncreated worlds of potential that lie within us. <sighs> yeah, that hits that hits home for me. It starts to strike some chords, and anyone that knows me knows that I freaking love this stuff like so much. Through conscience, we can come in contact with universal laws or principles with our own singular talents and avenues of contribution, and with the personal guidelines within which we can most effectively develop them. 
combined with self-awareness, these two endowments empower us to write our own script. I don't even know if there are enough hours in the day to, for me at least, to fully comprehend the what I just read right there. Because, I mean, how powerful is that? I'm, I'm going to just like go over it again and try to dissect what it actually means for me. So through imagination, we can visualize we can visualize the uncreated worlds of potential that lie within us. So like, um, I have this theory that I don't remember if I heard someone say this or if I've kind of just culm- if I've kind of like gathered it as a culmination of thoughts from many people. But I have this theory that our minds would not be able to conceive of outcomes or possibilities in our imagination if those possibilities were not possible to be able to exist or or manifest themselves in the physical world. So for example, like I'll give it, I'll give a practical example of this. Elon Musk would not have the capability of conjuring up the very thought in his mind of the possibility of going to Mars if in fact it was impossible for him to have the power to do so. Um, and I think this applies to individuals uh, and I also think it applies to humanity as a whole. So like, our collective conscience, basically, or our collective imagination. So like, but because think about how, like, if a caveman, if it was possible for a caveman to have the thought of going to Mars, that would be fairly dangerous because it would pull that caveman away. First of all, it would be impossible because of the technology and existence of like the resources available, Um, like actually impossible in the given circumstance, but it would be like our our evolutionary minds limit us from thinking or being able to conjure up thoughts that are not possible for us to achieve because our evolutionary mind is trained to only focus on those things within our realm that would protect us from immediate danger um, or enable us to further progress and thrive within our current circumstance. Something along those lines, I think. So the, I, I, the, the reason why I really like this thought is because it helps me govern what's possible for me to achieve. So if I think about, you know, servicing a million dollars in revenue as a personal salesman or something like crazy audacious in my current industry, um, is that possible? I know it's possible because there are people who have claimed to do it, but then I start to think like, is that possible for me? Well, the way that I would know if it's possible for me is first, if it passes the stress test of the fact that my mind came up with it or my mind can think of it, so like, if I can think of that possibility by virtue of the fact, fact that my brain has, is able to conjure up that impulse of thought, it must be possible because I don't think through ages of evolution our brains would allow us to think about things that would detract us from the current most immediate needs in our life in order to like protect us, something along those lines. So if it's possible for me to think up the idea for me to have the impulse of thought that must mean that that thought could exist there is a, there is a, a, a multiverse in which that thought exists in the physical world because i followed through with it somehow um and so then that just begs the question of like okay well if it's possible for me to create anything that i can imagine or conjure up then i need to make sure that i make i want the right things the things that will bring me most fulfill- fulfillment and meaning. And how do I get that? Well, I have to clarify my values, like Covey says. Kind of a tangent there, but you kind of get the idea, right? So imagination, um, through imagination, we can visualize uncreated worlds of potential that lie within us. And through conscience, we can come in contact with the universal laws or principles with our own singular talents and avenues of contribution and with the personal guidelines with which we can most effectively develop them. So I think what he's getting at there is like, our conscience tells us what is right and what is wrong inherently. And this is, I think, something you can prove throughout ages of time morally and seeing the threads of of morality that are common amongst all of ages of time throughout humanity. And that morality exists outside of independent of us it's almost intrinsic and that we have this like ticker inside of our minds that helps us understand if we're living according to those natural laws or principles that's our conscience it helps us connect with like what covey says connect with universal laws or principles and then that also helps us see what our own singular talents and avenues of contribution are so this is one of the reasons why lately as i've been setting goals and as i've been helping others set goals that work with me 
is the first thing that I've been trying to start with or regroup back to is who are you as a person and what do you think you were put on this earth to do? What is your unique contribution? Like what are the things that you have that no one else has? And then how do we go take those things and utilize them in what you're currently doing so that so that when you are done with whatever you achieved, you can say to yourself, had I not contributed that thing in, to the lives of those that I talked to or that I influenced, had I not done that, no one else would have because I harness the unique attributes and contribution that I have based on my unique purpose. Um, and I think if you really sit down and ask yourself, like, throw that question out into the ether, like, what is my unique contribution? You start to get some really cool answers um, and you start to do what Covey talks about which is called educating your conscience. It's a really powerful concept. I think it's, again, much deeper than what I even ha have time to go into right now, but super, super powerful. Combined with self-awareness, these two things, visual, uh, these two things, imagination and conscience, these two things empower us to write our own script. So imagination allows us to conjure up things that don't currently exist, Conscience allows us to make sure that we are connecting those things to our moral compass as well as our unique contribution or mission. And self-awareness allows us to say, okay, where am I at and why am I here so that I can then best uh, determine how to get where I'm going, where I want to go. Because we already live with many scripts that have been handed to us. Oh, sorry, let me get back to this. Because we already live with many scripts that have been handed to us, the process of writing our own script is actually more a process of re-scripting, a paradigm shifting, of changing some of the basic paradigms that we already have. A powerful, powerful stuff here. As we recognize the ineffective scripts, the incorrect or incomplete paradigms within us, we can proactively begin to re-script ourselves. I think of one of the most inspiring accounts of the re-scripting process comes from the autobiography of Anwar Sadat. Um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but this is, I love this story, so I'm actually going to go through it because it's super powerful. Past president of Egypt. Sadat had been reared, nurtured, and deeply scripted in a hatred of Israel. I think this is super applicable to the geopolitical things that are going on right now as well. He would make the statement of national, on national television, I will never shake the hand of an Israeli as long as I occupy one inch of Arab soil. As long as I occupy one inch of Arab soil. Never, never, never. And huge crowds all around the country would chant with him, never, never, never. He marshaled the energy and unified the will of the whole country in that script. The script was very independent and nationalistic, and it aroused deep emotions in the people. But it was also very foolish, and Sadat knew it. He ignored the perilous, highly interdependent reality of the situation. So he rescripted himself. It was a process he had learned when he was a young man imprisoned in cell 54 a solitary cell in Cairo Central Prison as a result of his involvement in the conspiracy plot against King Farouk. He learned to withdraw from his own mind. And this is a, this is a powerful concept. I'm going to talk about, this is making me emotional because there's some things that I've done in my own life that have had the most impactful, um, uh, have, that have had the most impact in me rescripting the, myself toward things that I value most and abandoning things that were not serving me at a very deep level because of this, what, what um, Cubby is about to say that, uh, that War Sadat did. Um, so what he says that he did was, I'll pull this up here. So he re-scripted himself. It was a process he had learned when he was, you know, imprisoned. He learned to withdraw himself from his own mind. This is a lot like what Viktor Frankl did. Withdraw himself from his own mind and look at it to see if the scripts were appropriate and wise. He learned how to vacate his own mind and through a deep personal process of meditation to work on his own scripts, on his own scriptures, wow, interesting, his own form of prayer and rescripting his self. He records that he was almost loath to leave his prison cell because it was there that he realized that real success is success with self. It's not in having things, but in having mastery, victory over self. Man, that's such a powerful concept. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul, right? Man, that is really, really powerful. For a period of time during Nassar's administration, Sadat was relegated to a prison of relative insignificance. Everyone felt that his spirit was broken, but it wasn't. They were projecting their own home movies onto him. They didn't understand him. He was biding his time. And when the time came, 
When he became president of Egypt and confronted the political realities, he rescripted himself toward Israel. He visited the Knesset uh, in Jerusalem and opened up one of the most precedent-breaking peace movements in the history of the world, a bold initiative that eventually brought about Camp, the Camp David Accord. <clears throat> Sadat was able to use his self-awareness. So that self-awareness is what allows us to say, like, maybe I'm wrong here, actually. Or, like, maybe the way that I'm living my life is actually the results that I'm getting that I don't like that are making me feel a certain way or, like, that are wrong. Maybe maybe that's my fault. Maybe, that's, maybe I'm wrong and maybe I can figure out why. Sadat was able to use his self-awareness, his imagination, so withdrawing himself and, and seeing what things could be, and his conscience, is this way that I'm living actually right? To exercise personal leadership, to change an essential paradigm, to change the way he saw the situation. He worked on the center of his circle of influence, and from that rescripting, that change in paradigm, flowed changes in behavior and attitude that affected millions of lives in the wider circle of concern. Fascinating. In developing our own self mass, uh, self-awareness, and this is how Covey kind of ties this home into how it applies to us, in developing our own self-awareness, many of us discover ineffective scripts, deeply embedded habits that are totally unworthy of us, totally in, incongruent with the things we really value in life. Man, that is so fascinating. So it's like, if I'm trying to find out the things that I'm doing in my day, on a day-to-day -day basis that are flowing from a, 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 an incorrect correct script that will only lead to my own misery and put me further away from the things that I actually care about most, if I'm trying to like, really rescript that, I have to ask myself, like, not am I an unworthy person, but rather, are those things in my life unworthy of me, right? That's kind of a cool paradigm to look at that. Deeply embedded, so in developing our own self-awareness, many of us discover ineffective scripts, which I certainly have done for myself, and it's, fu it's really fun for me to watch other people do this as well. Deeply embedded habits that are totally unworthy of us totally incongruent with the things we really value in life. And I would argue also with who we are, um, with our unique identity that is not only unique and has individual aspects of us that are unique, but that is like eternal itself that is unchanging. Habit 2 says we don't have to live with those scripts. We are response able, able to choose our response, to use our imagination and creativity to write new ones that are more effective, more congruent with our deepest values and with the correct principles that give our values meaning. Suppose, for example, I'm highly overactive, overreactive to my children. Suppose that whenever they begin to do something I feel is inappropriate, I sense an immediate tensing in the pit of my stomach. I feel defensive walls go up. I prepare for battle. My focus is not on long-term growth and understanding, but on the short-term behavior. I would argue that any sales leader feels this way at some point, right? I put all of my ammunition, my superior, my superior size, my position of authority, and I yell or intimidate or I threaten to punish, and I win. I stand there victorious in the middle of debris of shattered relationships, while my children are outwardly submissive and inwardly rebellious, suppressing feelings that will come out later in uglier ways. Oof, man. Going back to his idea last time where he talks about um, if we don't put the necessary focus on relationships, then the... Uh, the price we will pay down the road will be much more severe. Now, if I were sitting at the funeral, we visualized earlier, so now he's going to get back into this idea of the funeral, which is kind of interesting. I like how he ties it in here. If I were sitting at the funeral we visualized earlier, and one of my children was about to speak, I would want his life to represent the victory of teaching, training, and disciplining with love over a period of years rather than the battle scars of quick fix skirmishes. Man. I would want his heart and mind to be filled with the pleasant memories of deep, meaningful times together. I would want him to remember me as a loving father who shared the fun and the pain of growing up. I would want him to remember the times he came to me with his problems and concerns. I would want to have listened and loved and helped. I would want him to know I wasn't perfect, but that I tried with everything I had and that perhaps more than anybody in this world that I loved him. The reason I would want those things is because deep down I value my children. I love them. I want to help them. I value my role as their father. But I don't always see those values. I get caught up in the thick of thin things. What matters most gets buried under the layers of pressing problems, immediate concerns, and outward behaviors. I become reactive. 
and the way I interact with my children every day often bears little resemblance to the way I deeply feel about them. Because I am a self-aware, and this is obviously an example that can apply to anything, right? I'm even I'm thinking about my own role as a f- husband right now. I'm thinking about my own role as a leader in uh, in um, our business. I'm thinking about my own role as like how I serve in my church and community. All of that is coming to flashing before my eyes and saying like, is the way I react worthy of who I am um, and who I want to be for the people that I care about most? Because I'm a self-aware. Because I, have, because I am self-aware, because I have imagination and conscience, I can examine my deepest values. I can realize that the script I'm living is not in harmony with those values. That my life is not the product of my own proactive design, but the result of the first creation I have deferred to and circumstances and other people. I can change. I can live out of my imagination instead of my memory. I can tie myself to the limitless potential instead of my limiting past and I can become my own first creator. Gosh, that's so good. So, so good. Incredible. To begin with the end in mind means to approach my role as a parent or anything else that is most important to you, as well as my other roles in life, there you go, with my values and directions clear. It means to be responsible for my own first creation, to rescript myself so that the paradigms from which my behaviors and attitudes flow are congruent with my deepest values in harmony with correct principles. It also means to begin each day with those values firmly in mind. Then as the vicissitudes, as the challenges come, I can make my decisions based on those values. I can act with integrity. I don't have to react to the emotion, the circumstances. I can be truly proactive, value-driven because my values are clear. Wow, that one was a powerful one for me. Next, he's going to go into the personal mission statement, and I, I, uh, I'm, I'm pumped about this because the personal mission statement is the constitution, your life constitution that embodies how you behave um, as a leader of your own life and or something to that extent. But I'm excited to get into that next time. If you liked this, uh, this little study sesh, um, let me know with a comment on what you learned. Or if you're doing this yourself, let me know, on what, let me know what you're learning. I'd really be excited to hear it and uh, what's most meaningful and impactful to you. Or if there's stuff that you don't like also, I'd love to hear that too so that I can change it. And if if in fact it aligns with my values and, and, uh, um, but I certainly am willing to hear it all. So like and subscribe, Um, make sure that you actually do like this and subscribe to my channel so that you can get more of this stuff or so that more people can see it because I think that it's kind of a cool endeavor to study with the intent to teach and then follow on any of the platforms that you like, that you consume content on. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you on the next one.